Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Kloff, and I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD Experts broadcast. Um, today, we'll be talking to Dr. Roberto Olivardia about the connection between depression and ADHD in adults with attention deficit. Um, the fact is that 30% of individuals, people with ADHD, have had a depressive episode, and for adults with ADHD, the risk of developing depression is four times greater than it is for those without the disorder. So um, it's an important topic, and Dr. Olivardio will be telling us about some of the specific risk factors for depression that's been, that have been discovered by researchers in adults with ADHD, as well as some of the treatment options, both, both psycho, psychotherapy without medication and psychopharmacological that exist today. And he'll also give us an overview of some of the new, brand new treatment options that have been much in the news. Um, so I think it will be an interesting talk, and I appreciate Dr. Olive Guardia's presence here as always. We are very grateful for his time. I'd like to introduce him to you. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of listening to him in the past on the Attitudes webinars, he is a clinical psychologist and a lecturer at the, in the Department of Psychiatry at the Harvard Medical School. He's in private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, where he specializes in the treatment of ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and body um, dysmorphic disorder, and, and eating disorders. It's an interesting specialty in eating disorders. He currently serves on the scientific advisory boards for Attitude, as well as CHAD, with the uh, National Attention Deficit Disorder Organization, ADA, the Attention Deficit Disorder Association, and the National Association for Males with Eating Disorders. We really appreciate his expertise, and um, he has contributed greatly to Attitude over the years. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Olivar, you for being here. Um, as always with our broadcast, Dr. Olivar, you will present his slides, and then he'll take as many questions as time permits. Before he starts, we want to ask you to complete um, a, uh, a little poll on tell us about your interest in um, in um, depression and why you're here today. Specifically, um, are you interested in the link between ADHD and depression, psychotherapies or psychopharmacological treatments or treatment approaches for treatment-resistant depression or maybe all of the above? Um, so while you take that poll, let me just tell you a bit about our slide, our webinar. I think most of you have probably tuned into one before. But let me remind you, you can download Dr. Olivardio's slides right now in the resource widget. You can also resize the widgets on your screen. And this is really important. Don't forget to close out any browser sessions that may be running in the background so that you will have the best listening experience. If you do have sound problems, that is most likely the reason that the bandwidth of your own, on your own home Wi-Fi is not adequate. So with that, let's see um, what uh, what the slides are, what the results are. Um, poll results. I'm not seeing these here. Here we go. Um, Janice, are the poll results on the screen? Yes, I, I actually can see the, the poll results. Okay. Uh, it seems that 72.9% of people interested in the link between ADHD and depression and 12.6% of treatment approaches for treatment-related depression, uh, treatment-resistant depression. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, that's interesting. And with that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Olivardi. We look forward to your presentation. And everyone listening in, don't forget to just post your questions in, your, uh, in the Q&A widget. Thanks again. Great. Thank you for having me. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, speaking with, with Attitude. So I'm going to be talking about ADHD and depression. So a lot of patients that I work with um, who sometimes will come in because they have depression, turns out a number of them have either diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD. And certainly a number of my ADHD patients struggle with depression. Um, so it's certainly something that we see together. Studies show about 30% of people with ADHD will experience a depressive episode or have a mood disorder. Having ADHD puts you at four times the risk of depression. And for inattentive types, 
we see that higher risk. And for more hyperactive impulsive types, we not only see a higher risk for depression, but also a higher risk of suicide. In terms of what we see when people have both ADHD and depression is an increased severity of ADHD symptoms are often correlated with an increased severity of depressive symptoms. And so the symptoms of both conditions are worse when people have both than what would be present in having one condition alone. So it's very important for anyone who has both of these conditions to make sure that both the ADHD and the depression is properly being managed or treated. Having ADHD, for people who are depressed is associated with an earlier onset of depression, with more frequent hospitalizations due to depression, with more recurrent episodes, and again, with higher suicide risk. So it's incredibly important, especially for ADHD to be identified um, as it has a significant impact on the manifestation of one's depression. Now, there isn't much research looking at treatment-resistant depression, or what's called TRD. Now, treatment-resistant depression is basically defined by um, a individual who has a condition of depression where perhaps one, two, or more of antidepressants or other depression treatments have not worked for them, um, where the depression tends to be very chronic and quite severe, and again, where uh, significant medication trials have not worked for them. And we'll talk a little bit of, more about that later. Uh, there isn't much literature looking at treatment-resistant depression in ADHD, but we do know that treatment-resistant depression affects about 16.2 million Americans. Um, it's a very, very uh, significant uh, number of individuals. My hypothesis would be that given that we know that ADHD increases the severity of depression, can be a high risk factor for suicide, that my guess would be that there's a high rate of individuals with ADHD in that TRD sample. So why is it that 30% of people with ADHD can have a depressive episode or have a mood disorder. There are actually specific risk factors about having ADHD that lends itself to having a depressive episode. So we know that ADHD brains um, have sort of dysregulation of dopamine, which is one of many different neurochemicals in our brain. Dopamine is responsible for motivation. Uh, it's implicated in reward systems, um, in mood. And the ADHD brain basically is not accessing the levels of dopamine that more neurotypical brains are accessing. So when you have a, an internal physiological uh, less motivation, less reward, it puts you more at risk for not ever feeling sort of good and not feeling kind of your best in a lot of ways, feeling um, sort of like you're running sort of at a half a tank in that way. Uh, we also know that people with ADHD are more prone to emotional dysregulation. There have been a lot of uh, really interesting studies that have looked at how people with ADHD even process emotion. And studies show that people with ADHD can experience emotions more intensely than non-ADHD counterparts. They can have a longer time to soothe from difficult emotions. Um, they have a harder time transitioning out of and distracting themselves out of difficult emotions. So when you imagine an individual who might either due to certain circumstances or genetics or whatnot are experiencing emotional dysregulation, that's going to be further impacted by the fact that they have ADHD. Um, ADHD rarely travels alone. Um, in fact, I would say the majority of people certainly that I meet with uh, have ADHD along with a comorbid or associated disorder, whether that's depression, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, binge eating disorder, a substance abuse disorder, um, learning disability, that oftentimes you will see something that comes along with the ADHD. And certainly when you have ADHD plus something else, that can also set someone at more risk for, uh, for depression. For example, I have a number of patients that have ADHD and obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a very, very tough combination of uh, conditions to have that can really set them at risk for depression because um, they're constantly feeling tormented and, and in their heads and ruminating about many different things um, that can lead them to really shut down and feel very helpless. We know that individuals with ADHD struggle with impulsivity, um, and particularly when it comes to suicide risk, one of the uh, factors that 
is lend that lends itself to understanding why people with ADHD might be at higher risk, other than all the other factors I mentioned, is that people with ADHD have a higher degree of impulsivity. And so particularly for individuals who are really looking to escape negative affect um, that sometimes might engage in very impulsive self-destructive acts as a way of uh, trying to escape from feeling really bad and feeling uh, tormented by, by levels of depression. People with ADHD are prone to low self-esteem and a negative self-concept, um, particularly if their ADHD is identified later, if they've gotten a lot of uh, negative messaging, if they all of the struggles that ADHD can bring to people can lead people to often feel not good about themselves. Um, we know that ADHD involves executive functioning deficits, and if you uh, are failing in a lot of ways with executive functions, that can lead to failure in many domains of your life and a real paralysis, which then can lend itself to depression. If you're someone that has a hard time functioning at your job and you get fired from your job, if you have a hard time with relationships and all the ways that we need executive functions to have successful relationships. Um, I treat, you know, kids with ADHD who they're so impulsive socially that they don't have very many friends and that can lead them to feel depressed because we need friends, we need relationships in our lives. So there are a lot of issues around having ADHD. For people with ADHD who struggle with academic issues, we also know that 50 to 60% of people with ADHD struggle with a learning disability. So academic problems are, are common in people with ADD and that is a, a child's job. So it's almost imagining going to your job every day and feeling like you're failing, feeling like you're not up to par. That can easily lead to a sense of self as being not good enough and feeling worthless. And on top of that, you might actually get negative messaging. And studies show that people with ADHD are more prone to negative messaging from others, from peers, from teachers, from coworkers, sometimes from family members being told that they're lazy, they're not trying hard enough, stupid, um, you know, if you're unmotivated, if you, if you really cared about me, you would be on time. All of this messaging that really lacks a, an inherent understanding of what ADHD is, and if, especially if you're getting that at a very young age, it is very easy to understand how these are the ingredients for a recipe for depression. Um, as, in addition, as I was mentioning earlier, people with ADHD struggle with more social problems, more social issues, and children with ADHD are at a higher risk for physical and sexual abuse, and we know that the role trauma can easily play in feeling worthless and feeling depressed. Um, there are a number of reasons why that may be. I mean, partly we know ADHD is highly genetic. So some kids with ADHD often will have a biological parent uh, with ADHD. And if that biological parent hasn't managed their own reg emotional regulation, if their ADHD is not managed, they might have a hard time managing emotions and might resort uh, to sort of more physical punishment that can start to lapse into more physical abuse. Um, so there are a lot of um, individuals with ADHD that unfortunately have uh, trauma histories, and that's been documented in research studies. So we know now that there are all of these factors that really are quite unique or specific to people with ADHD that really sets a platform for why depression is uh, commonly seen. But even more, um, inter more interesting, but also more concerning is the risk of suicide. And there have been a number of studies uh, recently done that have looked at the suicide uh, risk in people with ADHD. Uh, suicide risk does increase with the presence of ADHD. And here's a study in 2014 when they compared people with ADHD versus people without found that 1.3% of the non-ADHD group attempted suicide, 0.02% uh, of that sample died by suicide, versus the ADHD group, it was 9.4% attempted and 0.2% died. That is just a statistically significant difference in terms of what we would see with suicide risk. Uh, Stephen Hinshaw in 2012 did a similar study looking at a sample of people with ADHD and um, actually did a 10-year follow-up and looked at over the course of 10 years and found that people who were the hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive type, or what we call the combined type, 
had 22% had reported at least one suicide attempt. That's almost one in four individuals. 8% of the just inattentive type reported a suicide attempt in that follow-up versus 6% of a non-ADHD group. And for girls who reported self-injury in a sample of uh, girls that he had looked at, he found that half of them had the combined type of ADHD, a third of them were diagnosed with inattentive ADHD, and 19% did not have ADHD. So again, clearly that combined type, that having that hyperactive impulsive subtype um, make someone at higher risk for suicide. Doesn't mean the inattentive and the combined type equally are at higher risk for depression, but as far as suicide risk, it's that hyperactive impulsive type. So I'm gonna briefly go over the psychological therapies because I know that um, that's, there are lots of resources that have been talked about and I wanna get into some of the more sort of cutting edge treatments. But generally, when you have ADHD and depression, it is important to treat them both um, because as we know, having ADHD can really get in the way of treating anything. And so the, the notion that we're just, we're going to treat the depression first and deal with the ADHD later, you're going to be treating the ADHD whether you, you know you like it or not because it's going to show itself through the treatment. Um, I have patients who in treating them for depression might be a half hour late for sessions because of their ADHD. So we're always working with the ADHD. Cognitive behavioral therapy, as far as depression goes, CBT is uh, very effective. There's a number of empirical, very strong empirical study. And what CBT basically does is target negative thinking, what we call cognitive distortions, and helping people be mindful of what those thoughts are, finding challenging evidence for them, and then combining that with behavioral therapy, which is what are all the things that a person is doing that we don't want them to do? Self-destructive behaviors, um, certainly avoidant behaviors, and what are all the things that we do want them to do? You know, getting out of the house, socializing, and you set up goals um, with that individual and meeting those goals while teaching them also anxiety management skills um, and a lot of skills that basically help make it easier for them to execute those behaviors. So CBT is very, very uh, useful in working with people with depression. Um, a, sort of an offshoot of CBT is something called ACT or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which I, I'm a great fan of. ACT basically takes some CBT principles, except it sort of goes in a different direction where as opposed to trying to restructure negative thinking, it basically says, okay, well, let's just say that you have this negative thought. We don't have to put energy into changing it, but at the same time, we don't have to accept it as truth. Um, ACT also focuses a lot on values and helping people who are depressed really recognize, you know, what is, what is my value system? And if, particularly with depression, people can feel worthless, they can feel like they don't contribute much, and helping them understand that they can execute their values by relationships that they have. That um, a lot of the patients that I work with who are depressed feel that they have to be the best, they have to look the best, they have to be straight A students in order to be acceptable. And so ACT sort of targets that along with CBT and really saying, well, what is it that we're really looking for? I mean, most of us are looking for, um, you know, to feel like we have worth and we have a place in the world and we have good relationships and we have health, physical and mental health. Dialectical behavior therapy, originally uh, conceptualized for people with borderline personality disorder, has been used now in a plethora of different conditions and, and disorders, depression being one of them. And DBT, very skills-based, very practical, uh, four modules, one on mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, and interpersonal effectiveness and assertiveness skills, all of which are very, very helpful for people who are depressed. Um, so DBT is a very concrete strategy-based uh, type of treatment, which can work very well actually with people with ADHD. I find with my ADHD depressed patients, they take very well to DBT because it is so concrete and, and skills-based. Um, IPT or interpersonal therapy, also very helpful, which really focuses, IPT is almost more the kind of traditional psychotherapy or talk therapy, but really focuses on the roles that relationships play. And IPT, their, their fundamental, um, their 
basically knowledge base is one of which if we have good relationships in our lives that can help us with our depression and a lot of time uh, IPT might wonder whether certain disrupted relationships could be the cause of depression. So it focuses on a lot of relationships and our interpersonal connections, which are very helpful. And by all means, with all of these therapies, it's not having necessarily to say do one or the other. You can really do a mixture and a combination of all of these. And of course, health hygiene, proper sleep, proper eating, uh, physical activity or exercise is all very, very important. We can't underestimate that enough in terms of how important that is at managing mood. Now, in terms of psychopharmacological treatments, uh, there are a lot of different medications that people can use, uh, particularly for more severe forms of depression. The SSRIs are probably the most common, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which basically more or less just allow for more serotonin, which is another neurotransmitter um, in the brain. And they're all different kinds. Um, you know, probably the oldest one is Prozac or fluoxetine. And Prozac is sort of more of a classic antidepressant, whereas some of the newer ones like Luvox or Zola are antidepressants, but they also have anti-anxiety qualities to them. So for example, people with obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an anxiety disorder, are often prescribed uh, Luvox, Zoloft, which are antidepressants, but what they also target is that sort of ruminative, obsessive nature that can lead to depression. So um, although I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't prescribe medication, uh, so I won't be able to answer individual questions about your medication. I can only speak generally about medications, um, but I would definitely talk to you know, your prescriber, your psychopharmacologist, in terms of which one of these might help. Some people do very well on one and don't do on the other, and so sometimes it is trial and error. Now, for more treatment-resistant depression, sometimes the SSRIs don't work, and so people have to resort to the older classes of antidepressants, such as the tricyclic antidepressants. Now, the reason that most people don't start with the tricyclics is that they often have a lot of side effects to them. Now, the tricyclics also target more serotonin and norepinephrine, which is another neurotransmitter. And for whatever reason, because depression is very nuanced and it is not the same experience uh, biologically and certainly psychologically for each individual, so the tricyclics might that hitting the serotonin in that norepinephrine system might be more effective for that person. But there are more side effects. Um, it could be nausea, dizziness, um, anxiety. So, but for, again, when people struggle with depression and particularly a treatment resistant depression, they, they weigh those options and they are willing to have some of those side effects as, as you know, negative as some of those side effects might be. But the experience of living with chronic depression, treatment uh, resistant depression is so, um, is such a burden um, for people that they're willing to do that. Um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors are another class of antidepressants um, that again, that actually sort of can target one or more um, neurotransmitters, including serotonin, dopamine, and neuro norepinephrine. Um, the thing with the monoamine oxidase is that a lot of them, um, there's a certain enzyme that interacts with certain foods. So some people can't eat uh, certain cheeses. Um, alcohol does not, I mean, alcohol, you know, too much alcohol doesn't mix well with anything, certainly. But um, even sometimes small amounts of alcohol don't mix well with the MAOIs. Um, so these are things that your doctor will talk to you about. But again, I have patients, they are more than willing to never eat cheese again for the rest of their life if this, if one of the MAOIs work for them when nothing else has. And then there are atypical antidepressants that sort of target things that are very different than all of those other classes. And there are new ones that are sort of coming out because again, we're understanding that depression is pretty nuanced, that it's not the same experience for everyone, especially when you have, often will have comorbidity. Now, what's also important to understand is that we have antidepressants, but antipsychotic medication can also be very useful for particularly severe or TRD, treatment-resistant depression, as augmentation therapy. That actually the um, FDA has approved three in particular. Uh, one's called the Bilify, Rexulti, and Seroquel, which are all antipsychotics, which used with an SSRI or an antidepressant could really boost the impact of that medication. So, so I have uh, a patient now I'm working with who SSRI didn't really work very well. 
added Abilify to it, and it worked wonderfully. Um, so really exploring that, there's a medication called Symbiax, which actually takes elements of olanzapine, which is antipsychotic, with fluoxetine or Prozac, which is an antidepressant. Um, and incorporates both. Now, the reason that antipsychotics would help is that what an antipsychotic medication does is really help loosen up sort of very concrete, rigid thinking, which is uh, very common in psychosis, but it's also common in depression. Sometimes the nature of someone's depression is that their thoughts are just so rigid and, and they're very, it's very difficult to sort of get out of that way of thinking. Um, um, it's not FDA approved, but there's some people off label that use some psychiatrists that use lithium also as an augmentation uh, to severe depression. So now I'm going to review um, some sort of cutting edge treatments. And I want people to be aware too, that these may sound a bit drastic, um, and they are. And the reason they are is because treatment-resistant depression is a very drastic experience. Um, and if you know, if part of you is hearing this and thinking, "Oh my gosh, why would somebody do that?" Well, that is. If only I want you to take that as an indicator of how difficult living with treatment-resistant depression is for an individual, that they're willing to do anything that works. So electroconvulsive therapy is one. Um, now, decades ago, it was called electroshock you know, therapy. It certainly had, it was depicted in Hollywood movies as sort of a torture device. Um, it is uh, not that. Um, it's actually um, a much safer treatment than people think it is. And basically, is electrical currents that are being passed through the brain it does trigger a brief seizure. The person is put under anesthesia, electropads are, are placed on their head, and it can either be unilateral or bilateral on one side of the head or on both. It takes about five to 10 minutes, and generally you would need ECT about two to three times weekly for about three to four weeks or about six to 12 treatments. Um, now, in terms of what that does, it's particularly useful for people who have what's called a catatonic depression, so individuals whose symptoms are very vegetative, where they cannot move, they don't talk, um, they're, you know, they're so paralyzed by their depression. It has been used very well in geriatric depression in the elderly. And uh, Caucasian men over the age of 62 are one of the highest suicide groups of all demographics. So this is a particularly effective um, treatment for individuals that might be at particularly high risk um, for suicide. Uh, but people of all ages could engage in ECT treatment who have uh, treatment-resistant depression. You'll usually see an improvement after about six treatments Again, it's much safer today than decades ago. There are side effects though, um, primarily that you can have some confusion. You can have some um, memory loss, what's called retrograde amnesia, which is typically not remembering things that happened a little bit before um, the ECT treatment. You can have some nausea, some headaches and muscle pain. So it doesn't come without side effects. Um, but again, it's how that individual has to weigh how much that's worth it compared to struggling with their depression. Um, it's been lots of research that have looked in various populations that show it can be very effective for treatment-resistant depression, especially in high-risk situations. Um, pregnant women, yes, women who are pregnant can, in, can have ECT. I had a woman who uh, struggles with bipolar illness and was pregnant and was at very high risk for suicide. And just to let you know, I mean, our evolution is such that for a woman to be pregnant, to um, die by suicide is extremely rare. It's very, very rare because our mother nature really doesn't want us to harm ourselves when, when we're carrying life. So when you're in a state of that, that's, that's, that's really a, not a good state, you know, clearly to be in. And for this particular patient, ECT, because medications wouldn't, um, would get in the way of, um, in terms of her being pregnant, could really be harmful to her fetus. And ECT was really the only thing that she could do. She did it and it was amazingly helpful for her. Um, and her baby was better off for it than the distress that she was under um, with depression. We also can use it for individuals with anorexia nervosa. I treat boys and men with eating disorders, and sometimes with anorexia, you can get so emaciated 
And the more you lose weight, the more depressed you are, the more psychotic you can become. And it becomes this very, very vicious cycle. So ACT can be a quick way, quicker way, of sort of getting somebody at least on track so that they can either respond to medications or can respond to more um, psychological treatments. And again, as I mentioned, catatonic um, individuals or suicidal individuals who need something very, very quickly, ACT sometimes can be indicated for. Now, another treatment that's newer um, and that many of you may not have heard of is called TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And what that is are magnetic fields that are stimulating nerve cells in the brain and they're thought to basically target um, the parts of the brain that might have some depressed activity when people are depressed, particularly in the prefrontal cortex. Um, the mechanism of action is not totally and clearly understood. It's not invasive. It's basically this magnetic coil. It looks like this wand that is placed against the scalp. And there's this magnetic pulse and this tapping sensation. Patients are awake. They don't have to be under anesthesia. And, um, and it doesn't hurt them, but it's a sort of tapping sensation that is supposed to um, send these mag magnetic uh, fields to those parts of the brain. The downside to TMS, which, um, first of all, it can be very useful and very effective. I've had patients with treatment-resistant depression where this has been the thing that's worked for them. Um, it's a significant investment, though. It can take about 25 to 30 sessions. So each session is about 20 to 40 minutes, but you have to go five days a week for about five to six weeks straight. So it is a significant investment, again, of time and energy to do. So for some people, that just isn't going to work really well. It's going to make it very difficult. But again, when you struggle with treatment-resistant depression, a lot of people, if they have uh, you know, the, the ability to transport themselves there or get there, and they have um, their insurance can cover it because it is very expensive. It's about $10,000. And it was FDA approved in 2008. And so typically insurance companies will cover it um, if at least four different antidepressant trials have failed. So you have your psychopharmacologist, your psychiatrist physician has to show evidence that medication trials have not worked in order for insurance to typically cover it. But having said that, as I'll talk about later, it's always good. You always want to be fully aware of what insurance will cover and what it won't because it varies probably by plan, by state. Um, the benefits of TMS, again, it's safe, no surgery, no anesthesia. You can drive or do normal activities right after you do it. You can get some headaches, some scalp discomfort, a little lightheadedness. Um, some people talk um, about some twitching immediately after, but those symptoms tend to go away shortly after the procedure. There are no cognitive functioning side effects, no memory loss or confusion. Very few might get seizures, but it's less common. Um, certainly if you have metal in your body at all, or for people with psychosis, it would not be indicated. Um, this treatment would not be as indicated um, for all you know, the obvious reasons, certainly having metal in your body with something that's magnetic. Um, studies show it's very effective for a treatment-resistant depression. Um, one study in 2012 showed of 307 patients across 42 different practices using TMS, that almost 60% has significantly less depressive symptoms. Um, another study in 2014 of over 250 adults found a 30% reduction rate even after a year follow-up, which is quite significant. Now, the results can last six months. They can last a year or longer. And I've seen all of that, and I've seen patients where it hasn't worked for them. So with any of these treatments, again, nothing's a guarantee, uh, but it's always good you know, going in and making sure you're educating yourself. It, it's often used in conjunction with antidepressants for optimization, and some antidepressants can work perhaps even better after a procedure like this. Now, a newer treatment is what we call ketamine infusions or ketamine treatment. Now, in case you wonder, I've heard that word before, Ketamine is actually a hallucinogenic drug that years ago was a club drug known as Special K that was um, associated with people having very dissociative experiences. Well, it turns out that there are properties of ketamine that can actually be very useful in treating depression, that it affects um, other neurotransmitters, glutamate and GABA, which are excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain. And what ketamine tends to do is it promotes synaptic connections 
um, within the brain for learning and memory, and it can block other receptors that can lead to rapid antidepressant action. So what it is, is you're administered an IV for about 40 minutes, the dose is often determined by your weight. You're totally awake. During an infusion, some people will sometimes have odd perceptions, dissociative experiences that often go, that will go away, not often, will go away once the infusion ends. Um, again, it's an investment. It's about six infusions over two to four weeks that often are more uh, clinically indicated. The first one is the most intense, um, but you can, after about 30 to 45 minutes after getting an infusion, you can leave the office and, and be fine. Um, studies show that it will reduce or eliminate very acute or distressing symptoms of depression, um, including suicidal thoughts. Um, it can actually induce neurogeneration or actually creation of nerve cells in the brain, particularly in the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain responsible for memory. There are some side effects. Some people complain of nausea, of drowsiness, feeling strange. They tend to um, go away quickly, which is why typically uh, doctors will want you to stay in the office for at least 30 minutes to an hour after an, an infusion. However, ketamine, even though it can be very effective, and I've had patients who one patient was dramatically effective. I've had other patients where it um, hasn't been as effective. It hasn't harmed them, but it wasn't what he hoped that we hoped it would be. Um, it's not always covered by insurance and it can cost about three to $800 per treatment. Uh, so again, you always wanna be aware of what insurance will cover if that if finances are, are prohibitive. Um, but studies are finding it prom very promising. 60% or more find relief from depressive symptoms and relief can be relatively short acting within one to three weeks, which is shorter than what you might see with most antidepressants. And it's often reserved for severe cases of treatment resistant depression. This is not for someone who has a mild um, you know, case of depression. Again, when other ant when antidepressant medications have failed, if there's acute suicidality, this is what ketamine infusions have been reserved for. Um, it's still considered experimental. Um, the FDA has only approved ketamine as an anesthetic and has not approved it as an antidepressant or as uh, for depression treatment. So that's important to know, but it is definitely being used with a lot of good results and very promising research. We certainly need long-term studies. Um, we don't know whether there's a risk of addiction. Um, preliminary studies are showing that's not the case because of course the dose is is highly monitored um, and it, because it's done in the doctor's office. Um, but again, just, just to be aware. Now, just this month, actually, a couple weeks ago on March 5th, the FDA approved something called S-ketamine or Spravato is the brand name, which is a nasal spray that contains properties of ketamine um, in conjunction with an oral antidepressant. And again, only reserved for treatment resistant depression. It's a spray that's administered only in the doctor's office. Um, so it's not something you can take home. Um, most common side effects people have is sedation, some dissociative experiences, some nausea, anxiety. Some people talk about vertigo or vomiting, and blood pressure. So all of, again, serious side effects that we wanna be aware of. Um, it has to be monitored by a healthcare provider at least two hours, for at least two hours um, after the dose, you are monitored in that office. So you can't just leave right afterwards. They wanna make sure that you're okay um, for about two hours afterwards. And it falls under REMS, which stands for the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy, which requires that patients um, do not drive, do not use heavy machinery. They sign a document, you know, basically saying that um, they're aware of the risks of you know, taking this. But um, it was approved because initial trials have found it actually to be very effective in reducing uh, treatment-resistant depressive symptoms. So briefly, before questions and answers, I just want to make sure, because we're talking about pretty heavy-duty treatment methods, um, to just be aware of certain cautions. Remember that a lot of these newer treatments don't have long-term studies. We don't have the kind of studies that we do with SSRIs or ECT, which is an older uh, treatment. Always, always, always educate yourself fully before going into any procedures. Speak to other people who have had these procedures. Now, of course, their depression could be very different than yours, but it's always good just to get different feedback and opinions. Ask lots of questions. Only go to certified providers who have mental health providers on staff because there are a lot of clinics that are being popped up all over the country, TMS clinics, ketamine clinics, and 
they're not all equal. They're not all equivalent. Some of them don't even have mental health uh, providers on staff, which you should always you know, have. Ask providers about their training, um, their experience. How many patients have they worked with? What their success rate is? What is the average number of treatments? There's also cost differences amongst different providers. Um, ask your providers if they're familiar with the latest research. You want someone who is um, really well knowledge on this, not somebody who took a weekend course on ketamine infusion or TMS. Um, this is too big of an investment uh, psychologically, medically, and financially. Uh, check out the setting or the clinic, compare prices. Don't assume that insurance covers it. Always check with your insurance company first if costs are an issue, which, you know, again, some of these things are quite expensive. And most importantly, do not let shame or other people's uneducated criticisms prevent you from thinking about these services or utilizing them. Um, for anyone who doesn't understand depression, you know, we, we would never question someone who has cancer and say, you know, people who have cancer will subject themselves to experimental trials, will do anything they can if their life is on the line. And no one questions that. No one says, oh, I can't believe you would do that. But with depression, people, a lot of the, the sort of public will do that. Depression is a cancer of the mind. It is a chronic, very uh, difficult condition. Treatment-resistant depression is a very, very difficult condition. So again, with proper education, um, it is very important to open yourself up to different options so that you could live a life that you deserve to live and that is very functional. So I'm going to stop there for questions and answers. Okay, thank you so much. That was a fascinating number of people have commented on how useful those your description of the um, the new treatments for uh, treatment resistant depression are. Um, I wanted to just dial back maybe to more mainstream um, uh, patients with ADHD um, who have depression. There are a number of questions about in your practice with those people who are being treated for ADHD. What are, yes. what are what in your opinion? You know, can you perhaps? make a judgment or to suggest what are the mo more standard approaches to um, depression in a person with ADHD? Would you, is it more likely to be a CBT or a dialectical behavior therapy or an SSRI? And are there any issues related to the treatment of the two, two together, two medications for ADHD and um, depression? Are there any specific things that should, people should be aware of in terms of more than one medication, medication for two different disorders. Sure. So studies actually show that um, a number of my ADHD patients who have severe depression will, um, a number of them take both a stimulant and an SSRI. Um, they do not have uh, an interaction effect. So the stimulant doesn't make, uh, doesn't sort of affect the impact that the SSRI has and, and vice versa. So you can take both of those medications. Um, again, you know, always check with your physician, of course, and your psychopharmacologist just to make sure you as an individual that there isn't any contraindication. But generally speaking, there, is no, there isn't a contraindication. People can take both a stimulant or a non-stimulant um, with an, uh, an SSRI, an antidepressant. Now, when it comes to the tricyclic antidepressants, MAO, inhibitors that you want to, uh, there might be more nuance around that because some of them can have side effects of blood pressure, um, side effects with sort of appetite, and that could potentially have an interaction effect with stimulants. So that you just want to be aware of. But the SSRIs and stimulants, uh, typically not. As far as psychological um, therapies, my approach is very eclectic. I, I'm been, I'm trained in all of those, those things. So, and I find it's very helpful in sort of drawing from CBT, drawing from DBT, drawing from ACT, certainly interpersonal therapies. It really depends where the client is. So if I have a patient who's in pretty acute distress, um, I find DBT is the best um, sort of model, you know, right away um, alongside, you know, often medication will be part of that you know, treatment uh, regimen. But DBT is very skill-based, very um, applicable skills that you can use today. Cognitive therapy is very difficult when someone is in a real severe, severe depression. Like their, their thoughts okay. are not thinking clearly. So typically the more behaviorally 
um, focus therapies tend to be the better ones in acute distress. And then as the depression sort of lifts a little bit, then the person can process their thoughts better in their interpersonal relationships. But for treatment-resistant depression, where people are literally feeling like they can't even live another day, they're not going to want to process their relationships. Right. With their, they don't even think them, of themselves in that way. Do you, um, could you uh, come back to, you mentioned there were four components of DBT. And um, yes. I request that you repeat what those four components are. Sure. As that seems so, to be a useful treatment for people with ADHD. Yes, yeah, so mindfulness is one, and uh, for those of you who might, you know, attend ADHD conferences, there's a, a lot of great talks. Um, my colleague and friend Mark Burton does a lot of great work on mindfulness and ADHD. Um, his great books on the subject, and, and it really, I remember, you know, when that term sort of first came into the ADHD community, it almost seemed like an oxymoron, you know, <laughs> that the, the people with ADHD could be mindful. And it turns out, yes, we could be mindful that we're distracted. We could be mindful of where our thoughts are. Um, so mindfulness is one of the modules. Emotional regulation. So how do we um, in, uh, manage our emotions? Well, first, how do we identify them? How do I know what I'm feeling? Because a lot of times with depression, it's not even with depression, it's not that somebody says, I'm sad, I'm angry. They're just feeling empty. That's what depression is. It's feeling disconnected from your body. So even being able to have an emotion means that you're a human being. That in and of itself has an antidepressant quality to it. So identifying emotions, learning what are skills when I'm feeling angry, what is a healthy way to express it? not versus an unhealthy way. If I'm sad, what are ways to connect with emotion? Distress tolerance, so when I'm feeling super anxious or I'm just anticipating something, how do I soothe myself, which sort of can dovetail on emotional regulation and interpersonal effectiveness, which is how do I have great skills in interpersonal relationships. And a lot of it is really looking at assertiveness skills, which means I'm not, I don't want to be passive, but I don't want to be aggressive either. How can I be assertive, mm -hmm. which means I'm respecting my boundaries and I'm respecting your boundaries. Okay, that's helpful. So DBT is, is sort of your recommended um, psychological treatment for, or one that you've seen work well for people with ADHD and some depression, sounds like. Um, yes, yeah, um, I typically, I'll take DBT and CBT usually as the first line approach for psychological therapies. Okay. Um, I wonder if you have any um, thoughts on diet and nutrition as far as treatment for ADHD and depression. Um, mm -hmm. So from, I, from my perspective, I mean, certainly I look at it just from you know, eating well is just helpful all around, you know, just like sleep is very, very important, you know, to have. So making sure, I mean, we know for people with depression, um, as well as people with ADHD, that they're prone, people with ADHD are more prone to impulsive eating. With depression, we can see overeating or under eating. Um, so having sort of regulated um, eating, making sure you're having a well-balanced diet, um, eating three you know, to four meals a day, all of those things are really important. Now, in terms of uh, specific nutritional things, uh, whether you know, omega-3 fatty acids and um, you know, magnesium and those kind of nutrients, whether they have this sort of strong enough antidepressant um, effect, the jury is, is out, you know, with that, that we still need more evidence to really recommend it, um, that, you know, nothing's been recommended as a sort of antidepressant, you know, quality. Eating well is just really important, you know, to do. But I work with people who are, you know, eat healthy and eat all the right vitamins and nutrients. Unfortunately, it doesn't immunize yourself from, from struggling with depression. Okay. Um... Um, there's a listener who says that she's had seen reluctance to treat um, with antidepressants to a, a an adolescent specifically with ADHD, um, mm -hmm. that they feel that um, depression meds can cause side effects. Um, are there, and the question is specifically, are there ADHD medications that are best for um, mm -hmm for the symptoms of depression. And I guess a corollary question that came in about that was from someone who said that when she was taking her ADHD medication, the medication, she felt her mood lift 
And as it wore, as they wear off, she also feels that her 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 she becomes more depressed. Her um her mood mm-hmm. mood lift goes away. So, is there a, is there a treatment for ADHD? I guess is a question that helps the depressive side of ADHD. Yeah, so that's a good question. So first is um, antidepressants can definitely be indicated for adolescents and even young children that have, again, very significant um, you know, depressive symptoms. Um, I work with young kids with severe obsessive compulsive disorder that medication is saving their lives. I mean, literally. Um, so it, it, with an antidepressant, um, there are you know, mainly the, the side effects for a lot of the SSRIs that adults mostly complain about are sexual side effects. And they can range from everything from uh, not for men having erectile dysfunction uh, to not being able to achieve orgasm. Um, and then there are some people that don't have any sexual side effect. Um, For adolescents, we see less of that. I mean, sometimes you'll see a little nausea. You might have um, slight weight gain, but nothing that is, for SSRIs, they're, they're, again, relatively safe. Now, what's important is that there is what's called a black box warning on um, the SSRIs that say it can increase suicide risk. Um, Now, what's important to understand about that is, number one, when people Um, who are depressed, who end up dying by suicide. A lot of times those suicides happen when they're coming out of a depression, but they're not totally out of the woods of the depression. And so what's been found actually is that with a lot of these medications, it's not so much that the medication is inducing suicidal thoughts. So I've never had a patient that has never had suicidal thoughts, been on an SSRI and now is thinking with having suicidal thoughts. Um, I've had patients who have suicidal thoughts or who have attempted suicide or go on an SSRI and they get some relief from their depression, but those thoughts are still there initially. And unless they're really monitored, of course, we don't want, now they have the energy or the activation to sometimes carry out plans. And that's what you want to be careful of. Um, another theory, is Paxil, which is one of the SSRIs in particular, is the SSRI that is uh, tends to sort of do that more, induce some of that suicidal thinking. And one of the reasons for that is it has a relatively short half-life. So when it starts to wear off, it's much more sudden of a drop that can often cause significant agitation or anxiety in individuals who are depressed. And so um, that medication, not that it's you should never use it because for some people, again, that's the most important, that that's the medication that works for them, but to be aware, you know, of that. Um, But yeah, other than, you know, that, it's not that the medication causes people to think in suicidal ways, Um, but like any medication that you're on, you always want to be aware. And I, I would never recommend taking a medication in the absence of counseling or therapy or having someone who's, you know, monitoring that um, in a more therapeutic way. Um, now, to okay. what you were saying about the, that woman who talked about the, the taking ADHD meds can be mood elevating. I've also found that to be the case. Now, I, you know, it, it could be, again, when there's more dopamine delivered to the brain, that in and of itself could probably have mood elevating effects. But I find with a lot of patients, they feel better because they're getting more stuff done, that they're more, they feel more connected. They feel like they're able to execute all the ways that those stimulants are designed for, which is to help people be more productive, to help people, you know, follow things more fluidly to maybe instead of thinking of 10 thoughts, they're thinking of, you know, one. And that is, um, you know, that that's, that lifts an incredible burden, you know, from people that in and of itself could also be mood elevating. So it's an interesting question that I, I don't know if it's been um, really heavily researched as to whether it actually has mood elevating effects or as a function of just being able to be more productive, um, to feel more grounded, you feel better about yourself. I see. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, what about diagnosis? Um, there are a number of people who have said that they um, they're wondering how one diagnoses, how one looks at a patient and see and and determines whether the symptoms are a result of as you described undiagnosed AD, uh, untreated ADHD or depression. 
Yeah. So part of it is when we're talking about depression, even if it is a result of ADHD, it doesn't take away the fact that that person is still depressed. So the treatment mm -hmm. would still be, you know, pretty much the same, especially if the depressive symptoms get quite severe in the same way that if someone has a substance abuse problem that might be as a way of medicating depression, um, we obviously want to treat that depression, but now we have a substance abuse problem that we have to also treat and we also have to deal with. So it can become its own thing. Um, so in one sense, you know, that's important to keep in mind. But the other piece is really making sure and teasing out what are, um, how it can help people understand, particularly if the depression is a result of some of these ADHD symptoms of, you know, all these exe the executive dysfunction, these failures that sometimes people experience in life, all of these ways that they might have felt disconnected from peers and people, you know, in their lives. It can be incredibly validating for people when they get that ADHD diagnosis to say, oh my gosh, like now it's not that I'm stupid. It's not that I'm worthless. It's that my brain is wired a certain way and I never I never attended to it because I didn't know that. And now I can get the right treatment and management for that, which will undoubtedly lift some of these symptoms. And for some patients of mine who I see for depression and through assessment really tease out that there's ADHD there. Or sometimes they already know they have ADHD, but they don't connect the two. Um, really treating the ADHD can, you know, is the key to lifting the depression. And then for other individuals, the depression is independent of the ADHD, but it's still being impacted by it. So it really right. is important going to, and sometimes you don't have providers that are specialists in ADHD and depression. And if you don't live in a part of the country where you have access to that, sometimes it might take, you know, having two providers, someone who specializes in ADHD to, to do that assessment, and then going to someone who specializes in mood disorders and having them talk to each other and having sort of more of a team approach, which is certainly a lot you know, more effort than going to see one person, but will absolutely be worth your while to make sure that all of the pieces of the puzzle are adequately being looked at. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think um, one of the questions here, and maybe it's, maybe it's too long a discussion for this, is that how to work with both a psychologist and a psychiatrist or a, a pharmacological Mm -hmm. how, how does that work in your practice? How do you work together with um, another healthcare Absolutely. practitioner? Absolutely. That I um, so I don't. I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't prescribe meds. But I have right. um, some trusted colleagues, trusted psychiatrists that I know do really good work. Let's say with ADHD, and do really good. Uh, either have expertise in that, have worked with my ADHD patients, and I will send my patients to them for medication. And we talk to each other. I mean, for me as a psychologist, right. I'm always I'm all about communication and collaboration with other you know team members um so i know that i'm going to get an update from the, the psychiatrist about medication changes and they're going to hear from me if i'm seeing something that's a little concerning if there's an uptick of suicidal suicidality or, or whatnot so we're always in communication which is really really helpful for a patient um the patient shouldn't have to be sort of the the communication you know between professionals that it really should fall on the professionals to coordinate with each other um you know on, on a number you know of, of providers so yes so once you meet with a therapist or a psychiatrist you and then meet with the other you would sign a release form that gives them permission to talk to each other and i would give i you know, full transparency is always best, you know, and making sure that your providers are all on the same page. Because sometimes you can't have a psychologist and a psychiatrist who see different parts of the puzzle and might be seeing it differently. And so for them, you know, sometimes they'll have really long discussions with psychiatrists saying, oh, that's interesting because this is what I'm seeing. And this, and because my appointments with my patients are 50 minutes and they're focused on lots of different issues, their appointments could be, you know, for med checks could be 15 to 20 minutes that they might mm -hmm. get different kinds information you know than i do so it's really important for us to because each of us have valuable information that we need to share with the other right i mean yes i think that's just important advice um another specific question that i'll throw out here um and it's come from a couple of people 
do you, what is your point of view on genetic testing in order to find the right medication? Mm -hmm. I have had patients that have done that, and um, for some of them, it's been very helpful and very useful. Um, that uh, I've asked some colleagues of mine who are psychiatrists sort of what their view of that is, and um, they say it doesn't. Uh, it, there's no harm, you know, in doing that. Sometimes it can eliminate a lot of the trial and error that some of the testing will show that certain SSRIs, for example, or certain medications might be tolerated better or work better for that person. And that might be the first trial that, you know, uh, that they do. And that could save them a lot of time than trying maybe three or four medications. Um, I've had patients that have done it and it hasn't sort of yielded, you know, the, the kind of, res, um, you know, when they practically executed that, it might not have been the kind of the medication that they thought, you know, it would be. So it's not a perfect science, um, but you right. know, I find it, it's patients have been reporting to me that they find it useful. And the psychiatrists that I have been collaborating with say that they find it um, useful as sort of just kind of starting with, you know, whatever medication is showing could be uh, most effective for that person. It could save time and and energy and money in cases. Okay, great. Um, last question. A number of, of people have said that they are on, have been prescribed Stratera specifically because it's helpful for depression. Um, yeah. Is that your experience? I, I have had patients that are um, prescribed Stratera instead of um, taking a stimulant medication with an SSRI, and especially if they, they might not have tolerated a stimulant medication very well, that an, a non-stimulant uh, you know, would have worked better, um, that does tend to have sort of some of those antidepressant qualities. So I, I have seen that, yes. I have seen that, okay. And well, well, butrin, Joel, well butrin is another one. Right, exactly. We, we do yeah. see that that's often um, prescribed for ADHD and depression both. Thank you so much. Yes. This has been, I know it's packed. Thank you. Everybody, um, that's a lot of information in here. Um, to all of you who are listening, you can download um, Dr. Paul Vardia's slides and you can listen to this, this presentation again um, on the Attitude website later today. Thanks so much, Paul Vardia. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.